Hi, this is Dr. Steve Sullivan. I'm now going to uh, give you guys a little bit of a video about the um, endocrine histology, part of the endocrine unit. So this video is just basically to get you guys a little bit more familiar, maybe a little bit more explanation of the histological images of the uh, endocrine organs. So I picked out uh, a few glands and organs that are integral parts of the endocrine system and organs that we talk about in the notes and I'm just going to point out some of the histological properties of those particular organs. Just keep in mind that you should be using this in conjunction with your notes and not instead of your notes. So you are still responsible for all the things covered in the notes regarding these particular images. The first thing I want to look at is the pancreas. The pancreas is very unique because the pancreas is actually both an endocrine and an exocrine gland. It not only secretes hormones, but it also secretes some very important digestive enzymes. So because of that different functionality between the different parts of the pancreas, there's actually very different cell types in the pancreas. And those cells can be observed in, in very defined compartments within the pancreas. So if we look here, we're going to see a few different types of cells. First off, we see some very round cells here. And, and cells that really organize themselves in round orientations. And in anatomy, we use a term called asinar to mean round. So asinar cells are round cells. And all of these that in this particular image are stained in a reddish uh, color are the acinar cells of the pancreas. And those acinar cells are the exocrine cells of the pancreas, which we'll talk about in more detail in the digestive unit because they secrete digestive enzymes. You're also going to notice that there is an area of this slide where the cells look different. And this particular area here, which is a compartmentalized bundle of different cells in the pancreas, is called a pancreatic islet. It's also known as the an islet of Langerhans. So Langerhans is someone who was uh, this was named after. This pancreatic islet contains four different types of cells. In this islet are alpha cells, beta cells, delta cells, and F cells. I'm mainly concerned with alpha and beta cells. And the reason why I'm concerned with alpha and beta cells is because they secrete the most powerful uh, hormones of the pancreas. So this islet of Langerhans, the pancreatic islet, is the endocrine portion of the pancreas. Alpha cells secrete a hormone called glucagon and beta cells secrete insulin. These are very important hormones for blood sugar regulation. Uh, you can read more about those in the notes. Here's another image of the pancreas and this is taken directly from one of our microscope slides in the lab and in this you, you can see very clearly that there are acinar cells and there are islet cells. This is the pancreatic islet right here. You can see how much different that bundle of cells is than all of these bundles of acinar cells which secrete the enzymes for digestion. Make sure that you can identify an islet versus an acinar cell. You won't be asked to identify specific alpha, beta, delta, or F cells but know the islet from the acinar. The thyroid gland is really unique because the thyroid gland has these organized compartments called thyroid follicles. And these follicles are filled with a substance called thyroglobulin, which is the storage form of the two main thyroid hormones, T3 and T4, which are named for the number of iodine atoms in the molecule. The thyroid also produces a hormone called calcitonin, which is a calcium regulator that is not called the thyroid hormone because it doesn't do the 
type of thyroid hormone activities like regulate body temperature, cellular activity, metabolic rate, etc. But what calcitonin does is it helps to uh, cause the bones to uptake more calcium, to decrease the amount of calcium in the blood and increase the amount of calcium in your bones. T3 and T4 are responsible for increasing metabolic rate uh, and cellular activity, which helps body temperature, etc. So thyroglobulin is a storage form of T3 and T4. And your thyroid stores about a 100-day supply of thyroid hormone as the storage form of thyroglobulin inside the thyroid follicles. If we take a close-up look, a high magnification look at one of these follicles, you'll notice that they are lined with simple cuboidal epithelium. Each of these is a single layer of cuboidal cells. So that's a good thing to look for in the thyroid gland. Is one, look for there being a follicle filled with a product, a colloid, called thyroglobulin, and see that that follicle is lined with simple cuboidal epithelium. Those are your tips for recognizing the thyroid gland. Now the thymus <clears throat> has some immune function. And the thymus is a very lobuled gland. It's found uh, above the heart. It's actually mostly degenerated in adults, but it's uh, very large in, in uh, embryos and fetuses. And what you'll notice is that you've got the thymus set up in these lobules called thymic lobules. <clears throat> Each of those lobules is, is divided from one another by what's called an interlobular septum. And each lobule has a cortex and a medulla. So those are important things to recognize the thymus. The testes, the male gonads, are basically a big bundle of tubes. And they are coiled tubes. And what you're looking here at, at is cross sections of these tubes. These tubes are called seminiferous tubules. Tubule because they're really small. Small tube. Seminiferous tubules. And that is where sperm production takes place, in the seminiferous tubules of the testes. Now the testes also produce hormones um, like testosterone, and then there's also lots of interstitial cells holding those tubules together. But inside these tubules is where sperm production takes place. And if you look at a very close-up picture of one of these tubules, you can see inside here are immature sperm cells called spermatids. So one of these cross-sectional tubes, imagine you're holding a bundle of hoses and you cut them and then look inside the hose and you would see a big bundle of circles like that. Each one of these tubes is a seminiferous tubule and inside of it are these immature sperm cells called spermatids. The female gonads or ovaries are a little bit more complicated. Uh, ovaries produce also a lot of hormones, estrogen, progesterone, uh, very important sex hormones. They're very important for regulating the menstrual cycle as well as um, uh, uh, getting the body ready for pregnancy and to support a, a developing embryo and fetus. Uh, we'll talk more about that in the reproductive system. But but ultimately, one of the main things that the, that the ovary does is to produce and support an oocyte. The oocyte is what eventually will be released as a as an ovum to be fertilized by a sperm cell. So the way this happens is every month about 20 follicles begin to develop and each of these are ovarian follicles. Right, they, st they can start off really small and they begin to mature as they move from the medulla out towards the cortex of the ovary. So inside each of these follicles, an oocyte is supported and grown and nourished. 
until one of those follicles becomes the dominant follicle and only one oocyte should be released each month in normal circumstances. So this here would be a follicle. Inside is an oocyte and it's a primary oocyte. Until it gets released and it becomes a secondary oocyte. So ovarian follicle right here, this whole thing here, and oocyte. The pituitary gland has two distinct sections, the posterior and the anterior. And you can read about those those differences in the notes, but the main thing to, to distinguish between those two is that the posterior pituitary gland is really extensions of axons from the hypothalamus. Because of that, it's also called the pars nervosa or the neurohypothesis. The anterior pituitary gland is mostly glandular tissue that produces and secretes its own hormones, and it's called adenohypothesis. Adeno for gland, neuro for neurons. This is where you're going to find your growth hormone and your thyroid stimulating hormone, etc. The uh, gonadotropin hormones like FSH and LH, uh, those are coming from the adenohypothesis. The neurohypothesis or the posterior pituitary is where you have the uh, the hormones that are produced by the by the hypothalamus, like oxytocin, an antidiuretic hormone, stored and released from the posterior pituitary, and then in between the two is the pars intermedius. Is the pars intermedius? That's the separating wall between the post and anterior pituitary. You can read a lot. There's a lot in the notes about the pituitary gland and all the different hormones that it secretes and influences. The parathyroid hormone is two, two nodules on either side of the thyroid gland, so four little nodules. And the parathyroid gland secretes one hormone, parathyroid hormone. That hormone is the opposite of calcitonin in that it, it causes calcium to be released from the bones and put back into the bloodstream. So when, heart, when blood calcium is low, parathyroid hormone gets released to break down bone tissue and get calcium into the bloodstream. And there's two types of cells for the parathyroid gland. And they are oxyphil cells and chief cells. It's the chief cells that actually produce the parathyroid hormone, which is abbreviated PTH. And the oxyphil cells really don't have a known function. The adrenal glands, which are also known as the suprarenal glands, because of their position superior to the kidneys, is a, a nice unique gland because it consists of almost two separate endocrine glands in one. The medulla of the adrenal gland is very different from the cortex of the adrenal gland. The cortex is divided up into several zones three zones there. Plus there's a thin capsule surrounding the adrenal glands. The cortex is responsible for secreting the glucocorticoid hormones like cortisol, corticosterone, mineralocorticoids. These are um, hormones that body uses to defend against stresses. It uses as anti-inflammatory and also for glucose regulation. That's the adrenal cortex. The medullary hormones of the adrenal gland are where you will get what's called adrenaline, which is a general term for norepinephrine. Norepinephrine and epinephrine are the hormones that are associated with the sympathetic nervous system. They increase your heart rate, increase your breathing rate. They're the, the hormones that are very stimulatory to your body. The adrenal medulla secretes the norepinephrine and epinephrine the cortex re re secretes the corticoids. So you can read more about those in your notes uh, for more detail on what they do. But please be able to identify the cortex versus the medulla in the adrenal gland. 
Okay, so that concludes the video. There's just really a handful of hormones that I want you to be able to identify under the microscope. Uh, these images that I've shared with you in this video may or may not appear on the actual website or may not be labeled to the detail that I've described in the video. However, this will definitely be covered on the exam and you are responsible for being able to understand that. So this video should help you with your exam. Uh, good luck. If you have any questions, please contact me as soon as possible and I will try to answer them as quickly as I can.